So, so that's my teaching hospital where I work. There's, uh, I've got no financial relationships, no conflict of interest, and I want to take this opportunity to thank Afran, Kenya Renal Association, IPNA for their kind invitation. The key points, we'll just look at evolution of pediatric nephrology in Nigeria. We we'll look at some common kidney diseases in Nigeria, specific challenges in a disadvantaged population, and we just have a brief look at the pediatric renal transplantation, the efforts we have made so far, and the advocacy groups. Pediatric nephrology was born in Nigeria in 59 years ago. Uh, when it was published in The Lancet by Professor Denny Yi, who just passed away on the last week, and others, describing malaria nephropathy. They described this glomeruli that we had diffuse plexiform thickening of the capillary walls with no mesangial expansion or proliferation. These, res these studies, these um, biopsies have no longer been seen since 1980. It went from 1960, but nobody, have a, if anybody knows anybody who has described this since that time, please let me know. We haven't seen it again, and we have been doing biopsies. So um, we, we questioned some of the research work. We wondered, was it just malaria, or is it loss of the other infections that we have, and, uh, or is it because there's no availability of uh, anti-malarial medications? If we just have a look at acute kidney injury, this is where, in fact, we find that malaria plays a very, very significant role. It's a very important cause of AKI, uh, accounting for 3.3% in severe malaria. It's one of the commonest causes of AKI, and we do have quite a bit of HOS. I will show you some pictures later. Our dialysis access rate is poor, and we tend to use peritoneal dialysis for the, those aged less than five years, and hemodialysis for older children. Yeah. There is a, I'm sorry, this, uh, yeah, this is why I had problems. There's a, a, some virus somewhere that's destroying the slides. Yeah, that's why I had problem putting up the other one. So I had a, a nice picture just there. This is a picture of nephrotic syndrome. Uh, sorry, <laughs> this is nephro nephrotic syndrome is one of the commonest <laughs> renal disorders that we have. Um, it is a majority asteroid sensitive, and it's very interesting that I published a paper when I fe well we published the paper when we first came back in 1987, and up till that time, all cases were being they were talking about steroid resistance, steroid resistance, and really that paper I still have the paper. It just basically all that I did was just read the books, take it the way it is, the way I had practiced it while training. I trained in sick kids, by the way, and, to, and um, Birmingham, and just gave the medications the way it was supposed to be, and then found that uh, we had steroid sensitive. In fact, all of them were steroid sensitive. And from that time, all the other centers have been recording steroid sensitivity. We have had quite an increase of lupus cases recently. We have described two cases of congenital nephrotic syndrome. This is a case of familial focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. That's the boy on the left with the mom, the same mom there on the right. These two children presented with nephrotic syndrome. And biopsies that we did showed typical FSJS, both on the left and on the right, uh, the male and the female. We actually did genetic studies on them. We, are, you know, we thought we were going to find something, but all the genes were, well, I wouldn't say all the genes. The ones that we had done, WTA1, NPHS2, and APOL1, which you may expect to be show up, were absent. We have had a case of renal artery stenosis, which I probably think is the first, because we had had, I had had quite a few when I had them. Um, uh, worked in Hospital for Sick Kids, Toronto. This four-year-old presented with hypertensive urgency with blood high, very high blood pressures, 140 over 100. He was on, he is, he is still on amlodipine, labetalol, and hydralazine. He still has a very high blood pressure. Which medication should I not place him on? 
ACE, that's right. You must not place such a child on ACE inhibitor. So this is why it's important to know what is the cause of your hypertension. Uh, CT Angio has actually confirmed the right renal artery stenosis. Unfortunately, we don't have some of these other things, DMS, AMAC3, that you know, would be nice to do. I don't know why, whether it is just an isolated renal artery stenosis, whether it is fibromuscular dysplasia, or whether it is a part of Takayasu, but our angio didn't really show that. It's just that I was quite impressed when I went to Cape Town, you had a lot of Takayasu, and we described three with BALF in, uh, in uh, uh, sick kids. UTI and posterior urethral valves, we have quite a lot of urinary tract infection and a lot are associated with posterior urethral valves. I don't know whether to call it an epidemic of posterior urethral valves or whether it is just that we are picking them up now, you know? But we see a lot and they are one of my greatest headaches. She was talking about bladder there. What do you do with them? You know, do you, you can't transplant them with thick bladders. And um, the majority end up with end-stage renal disease and even when you transplant them, you have the problem with the bladder. So another thing that we have found, actually, we've done some studies, primary reflux is very, very uncommon. In fact, I haven't seen one single primary reflux in, in our country. Just looking at, this is obviously for, uh, things I've looked at, um, studies done in developed world. In 19... 100% of cases of posterior urethral valves ended up with end-stage renal disease in the 1919s. Then it went down to 90, and now, well, 2011, when that thing was done, 45%, I'm sure it's even less now, that end up with end-stage renal disease with better management. Survival in posterior urethral valves, on the other hand, 25% were surviving in 1919, so went up to 60, 90, I know it's around 97 to 98 now, surviving, uh, following treatment, and of course, uh, in utero diagnosis and early treatment. Some of our very, very um, challenging cases have been CKD, whether it's from PUV or from other causes. This is a 13-year-old who uh, was diagnosed with lupus and originally went into AKI, but we believe definitely went into end-stage renal disease, was coming in with pulmonary edema. Money was not a problem. She went to Abuja where there was plasma pharesis. This was done. The child was put on prednisolone and the MMF and uh, we talked about kidney transplantation. There was initial reluctance with kidney donation. The mom later volunteered to donate a kidney. After very long discussion, in fact, the parents wanted me to contact Apollo in uh, India. They didn't want the transplant units in Nigeria. We did all that. After all that, one day we just sat, and after all this, he said to me, he said, in the, to the child in our presence, he says, you don't need a transplant. Nothing will happen to you. And that was the end, you know? And so I would have liked to know, what would you have done? Doris, what would you have done? Money wasn't a problem. Yes. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. all right, yes. Himself. Yes, 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 and have another child. Yes, all right, yeah. So, so I would have liked to know how many of you here would have said to the man, obviously not in the presence of the girl, would have said to him, look, your child is going to die. How many of you? Hands up, please. Wonderful, that's wonderful. I'm really enthused to see that. I must say... I find it difficult, but it's something that has got to be done. I knew it was going to happen. I said it to my colleagues, but I couldn't just, you know, come out with it. And, uh, of course, that's what happened. Now, another quiz for you. I have this 17-year-old who is an orphan with vertically transmitted HIV uh, and five, stage 5. 
CKA, and end stage renal disease. He is on hemodialysis three times a week, so money is not really the problem. He is supported by a healthy older brother who does not have HIV. I think the parents developed it after this first one was born. He was non-compliant with the drugs and became very depressed. He had a horrible chest infection, which we presumed was cryptococcal. His CD4 count was down to his boots. It was 16. Would you consider asking his senior brother, who was very devoted to him and very passionate about him, would you consider asking him to donate kidney to him? Oh, very good. Why not? Why not? Sorry? Well, that Compliance, yes, that's right. Thank you very much. Non-compliance, that's right. So, because he's going to do the same, you know, uh, when he gets the transplant. All right, so we answered yes and no, right. Last quiz before your lunch. 14-year-old with end-stage renal disease, who is also on hemodialysis four times a week. When they can afford hemodialysis three times a week, it means they are actually okay financially because it's quite expensive in my country. He came in, he's got massive ascites, various complications. He's got uremic frost, which you probably haven't seen. I'm going to show you a few, a, the picture in a minute. He hasn't been to school for one year. The parents are unwilling to donate a kidney. I, have, I worked out for the parents how much they had spent on hemodialysis and said, look, with this, you could have transplanted this child, you know, and all that. Uh, so, there is no cadaveric renal transplant program in Nigeria. What discussion should we have with this family? That's the uremic uh, the frost with the legs. Shall we tell them we allow him to die now or continue hemodialysis and leave things just as they are and hope? People are shaking their heads. Sorry? Ethically, you can't allow the child to die, okay? Everybody think, who thinks that? Hands up. Oh, okay, not many. About two, yeah, all right. Well, I think this is something, it's difficult, but we have got to decide on quality of life, isn't it? This child hasn't been to school for one year, you know? And he's living such a miserable life. So I, I think it's, it's a difficult decision, but I think it's similar to the other one that you may have to say to the parents, you know, should we stop dialysis, give him palliative care, and allow him to die? I think that's an, a very, I think that's the option. Doris, what do you think? Yes, a uremic frost. Yeah, yeah, right. That is, that's right. There are times, there, there are times, that you are quite, in fact, that's a very important cause, and the fact that he has uremic frost, yeah. So I would imagine that although they say three times a week, sometimes twice a week or less, yeah, all right. So um, now, if we just have a look, 50% um, of, of there's, in Africa, it's reported that 50% of Africa have no dialysis um, at all reported. We do know we have lots of infections. We have the CKD is rising. The burden is enormous. We have hepatitis B and C, HIV, CMV, parasitic, malaria, as I told you, you know, schistosoma, filaria, syphilis. We have all this. We have the bacteria. We have the streptococcal. In fact, we described the pneumococcal uh, HUS in one of the papers. We have salmonella, typhoid, shigella, E. coli, pneumococcus. All these bacterial infections. Klebsiella is a very important cause of UTI in our region. Don't ask me why, but it's the commonest cause rather than E. coli is Klebsiella. So when somebody was talking about obstruction, you don't need obstruction to have Klebsiella in Nigeria. <laughs> so, um, so this is, so I was talking about with the CKD, the quality of life. I believe that children should be children. 
there's uh, some virus that is destroying my pictures here. That one had a picture of a small little child who is on a hemodialysis, you know? I don't know what your system has against my pictures. <laughs> children should be children. They should play and enjoy life. In USA, as uh, somebody mentioned, I think it was Minion this morning, children are priorities on the waiting list, and they have a better outcome after transplant. Now, this is the very first patient who I advised to have transplantation in 1986. Doris, that's you and I, right? Yeah. She was age four years old, and the parents were wealthy. So she was stay sent to U.S. Her brother in U.S. donated a kidney to her. Again, then she had a cadaveric um, transplant as well, so too. She was separated from her family and she attempted suicide on lots of occasions. Yeah. Eventually, in fact, I remember once she came back to Nigeria, they brought her and she went into pulmonary edema and I thought, oh my God, after all the work they've done in the U.S., this girl is going to come and die on my hands. So <laughs> somehow we got her back there happily, you know. But uh, eventually, you know, she just went down because uh, you could see after a year, she was a changed personality. Sorry, I know I had to cover, well, I was asked to cover that face, but the parents, you know, uh, they gave me permission for that. But she was a changed personality. So in 2008, we formed the Transplant Association of Nigeria, and the aim was to foster transplantation and improve renal care. And I just want to show you what has been happening with pediatric transplants in Nigeria. So if you look there at the beginning, I think this is the point that somehow, I don't know, anyway. That one there, all right, okay. So that one there, so that's that, uh, the one that went, as I told you, and of course, eventually she died. Another one, a 12 year old was transplanted in India and uh, the transplant is still working well. Another one still working well. Now, the private sectors, this is St. Nicholas Hospital. These are the ones who are leading the transplant in Nigeria. The private sectors, it's not the, I, in fact, out of these, there are 15 total. It's only one, this one, Lagos, that was, sorry, yeah, Lagos. Um, uh, this, where is the Lagos one here? Luth, here. This is the only one that was done in a government hospital. And that was a pathetic case because this was a big girl of 16. The hospital, not the government, decided to fund her transplantation, gave her medications for six months. Of course, what do you think happened after six months? Okay, transplant, so well, the transplant surgeon, he did, he did his bit, but to me, it is really heartrending that this would happen. Uh, but as I said, that was the only one. All the others are private. This is private. This one, again, being a teenager, he stopped his medications, you know, playing football and everything. If he, he's back on dialysis. The other one is doing very well. Now, this other one, you can see done in India. These are areas where they are done. India, India. This is a private, these are all private here. And you can see this is from 2017. Yes, I assisted him in the very first child that was done. This chap has actually done over 900 transplants. Oh, sorry, 785 transplants. But he is the one who has done five pediatric. They are all doing well. He told me that, in fact, two of the cases are being sponsored by the state. You know, Nigeria is formed of many states. It's not the government, it's not the federal government, but the state decided to move in on this, which is good because it means this is somebody who has the ears of his governor. Uh, this other one also doing well. Yeah. Now, all right, okay, that went back. So um, there's this paper there, there is a sub and also we said, you know, very poor uh, dialysis and transplant access rate of 0 0.1 to 0 0.5. In contrast, this is adult transplants that have been done. So they started again, so it is that private hospital that started in the year 2000, the millennium, that's when they started. And they have done, they've done more than that now. But Zenit, oh sorry, it's missing here. That's that one that has done this children, and that one has done 795. So when you add, these other ones are government hospitals. 
they all attempted here and there, you know, to do one or two, but none of them is consistent. The only ones that are consistently doing it, St. Nicholas has continued, and that private place has continued, and together they have done more than 900. So what do we do when, you know, obviously in the care of children, particularly with transplant, you have the various groups um, helping, um, social workers, play therapists, etc. But in Nigeria, we found religious organizations very, very helpful, very supportive, both financial and moral. They have, uh, right. And um, now, if you look at our, one of the things that encourages me is that there's a lot of trained nephrologists. I know Minion tells me, in fact, she uses a word I'm not going to use, how there is a mandatory Nigerian. But don't worry, <laughs> South Africa is sending them packing now, so not to worry. But uh, so they've, a lot of them have trained hands on, have come back willing to help. The doctors are really fantastic. We haven't had a lot of nurses, not because we need them desperately, but the hospitals just will not. They move them. You have somebody today you think is a renal nurse. Tomorrow he's gone to emergency care. And, um, but the, the doctors have been absolutely great. And there's been quite an increase in a, in a trained nephrologist. So um, although we still are short, it's still about one pediatric nephrologist to 1.7 million children. Uh, the centers, we have just started a national registry, Nigerian national registry, and we've actually enrolled 38 centers. All 38 in centers have come on board. We have this transplant advocacy group where I work, others have other ones, and uh, because of our continued struggle with the government and uh, we have lots of issues, they have eventually now agreed to give us just six hemodialysis sessions. I don't know what is that for, maybe for AKI, I suppose. But even if you have CKD, government says they will fund six hemodialysis sessions. Yeah, it's a start, but, and not everybody's getting it at the moment. So anyway, we do our best, and then we, we, we console ourselves with this slogan, tush, we talk until something happens, we walk until something happens, and we push until something happens. We obviously take a lot of pride in doing things like uh, preventive, what kidney disease, we are quite active in that. Seminars, EPNA training centers now, we've got Lagos and Abuja, and then Nigerian Association of Nephrology and Nigerian Association of Nephrology Nurses, they have to really be quite uh, helpful and quite active. So conclusions and take home message, despite the challenges, tremendous rise in trained pediatric and adult nephrologists in Nigeria is something that we should be you know, proud of. There is need for increased funding for childhood CKD and for all the other aspects of renal disease. Need to train specialists in pediatric nephrology, palliative care. I think this is something we haven't been looking at and we really need to look at it. And we need to maintain quality of life. I believe children should be children, you know, drink, all that sort of thing. We need to maintain our preventive measures. So, I'll end by saying that with Samuel Jackson, they said nothing will ever be attempted if all possible objections must first be overcome. Oh my goodness, do you know what, do you know the picture they took away from there? Obama, you are the son of the soil, doing this and saying we can. That was it, thank you very much. <laughs>